Well, for the fully, go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> this is the best podcast we've ever done. <laughs> And welcome to another episode of Plain Truth, a Holy Spirited podcast. I am Maggie Ulmer, and I am here on Zoom with Scott Kisker, David Watson. Yay! Hey, introductions <laughs> virtually are so ridiculous, but necessary. Hey, yeah. what's up, y'all? What's up, y'all? Um, <laughs> <laughs> we are talking about a an article that came out in Newsweek about four days ago, I think. And uh, it was an article about the results of a particular survey done by Legionnaire, I think. I think it's pronounced Ligonier. Ligonier, thank you. <laughs> I think. Okay, I believe you. <laughs> I only had to read like two sentences into the Newsweek article to become depressed. Yes, for so many reasons, really. But so this, this leads into the thing I want to say is we don't typically like to just absolutely roast publications out there, but this article was terribly yeah. written. Okay, so the the thing that really caught my attention here, I mean, it says 52% of Americans don't believe that American adults do not believe that Jesus Christ is God. But, you know, that didn't surprise me. Like, only 65% of Americans are even Christian. Christian. Okay. But then it had a sentence which I thought was a little confusing. Nearly one third of evangelicals in the survey agreed that Jesus isn't God, compared to 65% who said Jesus is the first and greatest being created by God. I mean, both of those statements say the same. Mean the same thing. <laughs> yes. and they have com- they have different results, which doesn't yeah. make any sense. Well, and uh, it, it also depends, like, who defines what an evangelical is. Is this, you know, the person had a choice of, I'm an evangelical, I'm a mainline Christian. Yes, they did. I'm Roman Catholic. Yes, they did. And and so basically, if they if they, you know... Catholic and mainline Christian are actual like denominations to which one would have to hold membership. Whereas evangelical is like Mm -hmm. what I feel. Right. So like, right. You know, it, you know, it by process of elimination, well, you know, you're not, you know, you're not a Roman Catholic. Okay. I'm not that one. I know I'm not Eastern Orthodox. Okay. I know I don't belong to a mainline church, so I'm not that. So I must be an evangelical. Well, Well, but evangelicals are usually conservative Protestants. Yeah, I was going to say this implies that people are making a distinction between mainline and evangelical. And I think plenty of people don't. Right. Well, but, you know, we could split hairs on this all day long. It doesn't matter. matter. However, we slice it. Yes, it doesn't matter who's saying it. It is a terrible result. I agree. Yes. If you call yourself a Christian, you should be having a different answer to this question. What? How did they put it again? That was it was a little confusing. Um, Jesus is the first and greatest being created by God. That was right. one of the questions. So this is this is. I have a little article coming out in Firebrand about this. By the way, um, it, this, this this is, is the Arian the definition of Arianism. Yeah, right? this yes. is the yeah. Arian heresy. Right. Okay. So, Scott, tell us about the Arian heresy. Well, there's this uh, kind of upstart uh, presbyter in um, Alexandria who, who, who thought he knew stuff. And when his uh, bishop, Alexander of Alexandria, uh, decided to, you know, teach the doctrine of the church, he kind of like stood up big dramatic and, you know, contradicted his bishop and, and, uh, and, you know, basically said, uh, you know, Jesus was the first, the first creation. There was a time when Jesus was not, well, there was a time when the second, the son was not. Right. 
There was when he was not. That, there that was, was their, when he was not, yeah. Their little slogan that they had back then. Back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was their bumper sticker that they yeah. put on the back of their chariot. And so it, I'm just curious, in 2020, what percentage of people said, agreed, uh, evangelical said, Jesus is the first and greatest being created by God? Uh, 65%, 65% according to this <laughs> survey. Well, 65% are Ar- Arius. Well, here's the good news. He Let would be just, proud. Well, yes, he would. But here's the good news. In 2018, 78% agreed with that statement of okay, evangelicals. But, so wait, wait a second, wait a second. I have a a question here because I'm looking uh-huh. at the state of theology thing in 2018. Yeah. So it statement also, number six. Right. But I'm looking at statement number two. There is one true God in three persons, God, the father, God, the son, and God, the Holy spirit. Yeah, and everyone and their dog agreed with that. 97% agree. Right. Yeah. Okay. So we've got a misunderstanding about the Trinity and the nature of who Jesus is. So Christians are incoherent. So yes, you can't agree with those two things. You can't think that there's one true God who is three persons, all the same substance, and think that Jesus Christ is was the first, the first and greatest creature. being created creature. by God. Yes. I mean, the problem is, is that uh, your average layperson, like we know, because we know the Arian controversy, to focus on that word created, right? That's true. And, and you know... That that that's wrong. Whereas if you if you substituted like Jesus is, you know the f- yeah first is also bad. I mean it's just yes. it is a bad sentence. You're right. It's all but, bad. But people think Jesus is the greatest. Like lay people read that they Jesus is the greatest. Yes, that's true. Yes, right? but I think they're thinking he's the he's greatest. So great. The way people think. Muhammad Ali was the greatest. You cannot think that way about it. <laughs> you can't. Yes, I know. But Jesus uh, Christ is God. He's like when God says, I am the I am, that's Jesus. He's not just the greatest. He's the ground of everything. Just yes. clarifying. You. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you, Maggie. I'm sorry, I can't handle it anymore. Um, yeah, I think the the thing is, if people were presented, by and large, with the problem with the Arian heresy, with being both a Trinitarian, affirming God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and being an Arian, and seeing these are mutually incompatible, right? Like. Then I think they would say, oh, yeah, you know, you're right. But apparently in the Western church, this is going to surprise you. Um, we haven't, like, catechized our people really well. No way. In Protestantism. Are you kidding? And so um, <laughs> the claim Jesus, Jesus is divine, we haven't fleshed out that content very well. And also you could, you know, you, you could, I mean, in Col- in the Colossians, Christ him, you know, it talks about Christ as the firstborn of all creation. And, and passages like this are part of why Arius was able to gather um, a following. He had a big following. Uh, he, he, he was able to cite scriptural passages in support of his tradition. Now, now I would say, you know, th- the weight of scripture and certainly the apostolic witness would, would weigh against, you know, what Arius has to say. But he could cite some passages in favor of what he wanted to say. The problem isn't just that it's incoherent. It's that theology is systematic and it builds upon itself. And so if you say that Jesus Christ was a created being and that he's not God, then that creates problems when you get to um, the crucifixion and what the function and meaning of that is supposed to be for all of creation. But isn't Jesus in his humanity also preacherly? 
but he has two. No, but no, I'm not questioning that. But I'm I'm thinking about like if you said Jesus is fully divine and fully creature. I'm trying to think. I mean, to be human is to be part of the creation, and Jesus taking on the fullness of human flesh is thus part of the creation. But that's not. But that's that's clearly not. What yeah. is meant when we talk about the firstborn of all, all creation, you know, or what, or the wording of the survey, whatever it was. Well, I mean, but the Jesus wording does, was the son who is eternal takes on creatureliness. Right. But the question isn't about the son, which is the de- definition of Arianism. The que- you know, the, it's not the second person. It's Jesus is the first and greatest being created by God. He wasn't the first being. Yeah, and I also think that it goes to the way that we understand yeah, that's Christ true. It's wrong. as a being. I mean, he's a hypo, he has two natures. He's Yeah, I know, but I I'm just saying I I I sympathize with some you know, lay people. I mean, I'm a nice, I, you know, I'm a nice guy. Maybe you're I'm very too tolerant. Pastoral, of, um, and you're a who, teacher. who might be confused by this sentence because I actually think, you know, they made it confusing. I mean, if they had said, you know, the the Son of God is the first and greatest being created by God, well, that would that would be so obviously. But you know, does first mean in time necessarily, or or is he? You know the premier and you know greatest yeah. being created, and by being sinless, of course, he was in some sense premier. And I'm just being—I'm kind of being a, a jerk with the with the questions. But part of me thinks, you know, Ligonier wants to have something to cause people to freak out about, especially evangelicals, you know, or and, and especially evangelicals who believe that you know, salvation is ultimately dependent on whether you've gotten all the answers right on your catechism. <laughs> Exam. That, that sounds like a backdoor dig. <laughs> <laughs> I think... I, I, I love my uh, Lutheran Missouri Synod friends mm-hmm. <laughs> and my PCA friends. Right. I'm, in, I'm kind of inclined to agree with you. However, yeah, I also think that we, to David's point about catechism, we could just stand to have our people catechized better and they could value the manner in which faith is communicated more. They could understand that actually words like premier or first or created actually have a particular meaning inside of the tradition of our faith. And that when they hear them, in the context of faith conversations, they should know what they think about that. And people don't. People just assume, they just think whatever the surface level, check this box, Jesus is the, you know, son of God, he died for my sins. I can recite the thing I'm supposed to say when I join the church. You know what I mean? Right. And I was just actually saying this to David the other day in the car. I was like, you know, at least prior to the 20th century, people who were members of the church knew what heresy was, like they knew what they were supposed to believe, right? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, after World War II, and, you know, we've all joked about my, you know, catechesis making health food shakes, um, you know, we just thought, oh, we've got to like make these teenagers want to be here and they've got to like, we've got to entertain them and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, before... You used to have to, mem- you know, Luther's smaller category. If you were a Lutheran kid, you recited the answer. Yeah, I, I will say, you know, my you, kids- If you were a Presbyterian, you knew the right answer from the Pre- Westminster Catechism. You knew yes, it. Yeah. My, you could recite it. My younger kids just had, my two younger sons just had to recite the first two answers to that in a group that we're a part of. Yeah. Very yeah. reformed group. Yes. And even though it's, you know, from our perspective, not 100% correct, some well, of the things no, in the, the Westminster Catechism. The but, Westminster Catechism is pretty awesome. 
Um, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a bigger fan of the Heidelberg, but you know what? I know you are. We can quibble. We can quibble. But what I'm saying is at least you knew what the right answer was, even if you didn't believe it. You know, if I posted that this was a problem on Facebook, which I'm not going to do, (laughs) someone would invariably say, you know, you theological types up in your ivory tower. Yes, your ivory towers. You're, 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 they've, (laughs) Anyway, <laughs> you're always splitting theological hairs, you know, and and really doesn't it just come down to just loving Jesus, Love. being a good person, and yeah. you know why 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 is it even a big deal if if I'm an Arian? Well, because no, why, why does it even matter if Jesus is, you know. Just another the, human being that ju- you happen the to great, love? The, great, the greatest of all creatures. He's not just another human damnation. being. He's the first and greatest creature. He's the <laughs> right. first and greatest. <laughs> you don't think like Jesus is the greatest or the like first, do you? <laughs> I just like He's so great. He's <laughs> so first. <laughs> He's bigly first. <laughs> um, <laughs> so no, great. it's not enough. It's not enough. Right. Right. I wonder if they, did they have a question about like, um, you know, adoptionism or anything like that? You know, I don't know. I, I, I just wonder what the other, I can't find all the other questions. But, but, but let's, let's walk through, let's walk through this scenario. Could we, before yes. we move away into adoptionism, sure. let's walk through this scenario where, I mean, there were, there were people in the early church who didn't believe that even before Arius, right? You had the Ebionites. Right. Who, and they were adoptionists. Yes, they were adoptionists. That's right. But what if Jesus is a creature? What are the implications of that? I mean, a part of me, it's just, okay, I'm, maybe I'm just No, being... stop arguing the other side. <laughs> just don't. It's wrong. Because it's you'll be wrong. You'll be can wrong. Just, can we just ask what would it mean if if the second person of the Trinity, if the word of God, if the if if the Son of God were a creature? That to me is clear. If if Jesus is fully human, then in some sense, in his humanity, he is creature. All right, let's let's use the words of the survey. Um, Jesus is the first and greatest being created by God. If Jesus Christ was only a human being, what are the implications? Well, or, or if Jesus is not fully divine or if he's not fully divine, but everything else exists. Like, so God encountered the Israelites, like the Israelite people became a people and there's the Torah law and, and all of that, like, then, then we're all frankly in trouble. Right. If Jesus is not fully divine, then we're, then we're toast. Right. Yes. Right. Doesn't, but he, do- well, we're, he's also, we're also toast if he's not fully human. Mm-hmm. But why, why are we toast? If, He's not fully divine, then he's actually not sinless. And if he's not sinless, then he can't actually be, as John says, the lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice. And if he does not come in to sort of satisfy the uh, atoning requirement, then really we we should have never stopped. Like we should have continued on with the temple sacrifices forever and ever and ever. Amen. Like there's no perfect sacrifice. We just had to keep doing that. I mean, if he's not God, then our salvation is not dependent on God, but on a creature. We are not saved by God. Which is what I'm saying. There is something, I mean, the end, at least for me, the internal coherence of Christianity has a lot to do with the fact that both creation and salvation are acts of God's self-giving love. Mm-hmm. That God, God didn't have to create us. God did create us out of love. And God doesn't have to redeem us. But God has redeemed us out of love. 
Now, if God sent someone else to die, an innocent man to die for the sins of everyone else in such a horrid way, it's hard to understand how that can at all be just. Mm -hmm. But, But what happened is God himself took the sins of humankind upon himself. And in so doing, performed the perfect act of self-giving love. He didn't punish anyone else. And because he did that, we can be justified by faith and not by anything else. Right. And so it's like Hebrews talks about Christ is the perfect sacrifice, but Christ is also the high priest. Mm -hmm. Christ is the high priest, but the sacrifice is himself. And so if we lose the incarnation, which is basically what this is getting at, then we lose God's act of perfect self-giving love. And if we lose God's act of perfect self-giving love, then the whole content of Christianity sort of falls apart. It doesn't work anymore. This is, I mean, the people in the early church made these decisions. The theologians and bishops of the early church made these decisions for reasons. Well, it's, and before them, God made this decision to yeah. actually become incarnate. To God the Father allowed his son, the word, to become incarnate in Jesus. I mean, part of me is, you know, I just want to say this is, you know, you can, I, maybe we can do some mental gymnastics whereby in theory, like God could have saved the world in a different way, but it just doesn't matter because he didn't. Mm -hmm. That's not what happened, right? Like, you know, in theory, um, you know, the British could have won the American Revolutionary War, but they didn't. (laughs) But But the way in which God brought, this particular way in which God... Uh, brought about salvation through the orthodox witness of the church says something about the character of God, mm-hmm. right? It yes. says something about the character of God and the nature of salvation, which that is that God would act in such a self-giving way out of perfect love for sinners who have rejected him. That says something about the character of God. And yeah, it says something about the nature of our salvation as well. Which is that creatures cannot save themselves. Nope. Our salvation is utterly dependent on love of God of which you just spoke. And it has been that way since the beginning. That was what the temple system was. It was It was a process instituted by God for them to do that was the appropriate adequate thing in that, you know, at that time in that moment. So, um, and today, so it's always been his self giving act. So that's why it's wrong. So stop it. You guys <laughs> I, I just, think quit you just it. muddied the waters. I don't know, but yes, just quit it with that backwards thinking about Jesus. I mean, the, 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 the bottom line is if you lose the incarnation, Mm -hmm. then you lose the whole Christian economy of salvation. Mm -hmm. You have a new faith, right? You cannot claim to be a, a, a gospel slash evangelical Christian and deny the full humanity and divinity of the one who sacrificed himself on the cross, because that is the gospel. So what, who would you, would you be? So if, if you did sacrifice that, would you be, what would you be? Because there are like, there are belief systems that claim Christ as creature. Is, is it Jehovah's witness? I don't know. Islam. Well, yeah, Islam, Islam. Yeah. yeah, you could be Muslim. Yeah, yeah. he's um, a really Muslim. super good dude who is going to judge you one day, but he is not God, and he didn't die on a cross. So I thought. I mean, 
not not to be glib about all this, but I, I thought it was funny. I was as I was reading through the article, I sort of skimmed the comments. And one of the comments was, so you think Jesus is a really good teacher, but you don't believe anything he taught. And I was like, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, but also, you know, as I was thinking about this, I mean, this article I wrote, there are a lot, there's a lot that I cut out of it. But one of the things that I cut out was, you know, a discussion of some of the claims that Jesus does make about himself in scripture. And we can, yeah. you know, I mean, John is the low hanging fruit here. I mean, every right. other, every other time Jesus turns around, he's saying <laughs> something about his relationship to the father. Like I am the father. I well, am and just, the father, I am, one. He is, you know, yeah, yeah. All the I am statements yeah. evoking the divine name from Exodus three. But, you know, in the beginning of Mark, when Jesus is having these controversies with the Pharisees and the scribes, he says a couple of things that I think are revealing, which is, um, one is, he says, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Well, who is the Lord of the Sabbath? I mean, who is the one who commanded the Sabbath? There's only one Lord of the Sabbath. <laughs> right. right. It's not a person, unless that person is also... God. God. And, and then there's a, a, an earlier controversy, a little bit earlier, when he says, the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Mm -hmm. And, you know, his opponents, I mean, what's happened is they bring the paralyzed man into him. And then he says, son, your sins are forgiven. And, and uh, I th the Pharisees, I think, who are there say, who... Who, who does this guy think he is? You know, there is no one who can forgive sins except God alone, at which point you're supposed to go, oh, yeah, well, bingo. And then Jesus says, but so that you will know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. In other words, so that you'll know who I am, I tell you, take up your mat and walk. Mm -hmm. And the guy does. Because presumably God would not bless the prayers of a blasphemer. I mean – but, but even so, I mean, like I can, I can come up with some logic that, uh, you know, if I were, if I were, you know, a Unitarian or something and I, I, I could read that story and I could say, um, what, what Jesus is trying to tell us is that we humans have the possibility to forgive other people's sins. Yeah, actually, I mean, Sorry, to me, in Scripture, the far more problematic passages, if you're going to try to deny the divinity of Christ, are all the places where people worship Jesus, Jesus. the man, mm -hmm. right? Over and over again right. in every one of the Gospels, not just John, but mm -hmm. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And, you know, they're always worshiping him, which... You can't do. That's not okay if, yeah. if it's not divine. So Yeah, I, I was going to say, I was like, I don't think John is low-hanging. I mean, I know what you mean when you say that because he, it, compared to the Synoptic Gospels, he goes out of his way to prove this point. But I think that he does it because this is a, it's obviously written differently. It's a spiritual truth that he's expounding upon because well because he knows it's present in the other gospel in 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 the reality and the culture of everything that they believe so also it's my favorite so it's not low hanging i mean it it what i mean by low hanging fruit is it's so obviously John, over it's the top. So obviously a high christology right, right. i don't think there are any low christologies in the new mm -hmm. testament but john just is just much more obvious about yeah, it absolutely. than the other than the synoptic gospels mm -hmm. are um but you could look at the christ hymn in colossians one you could look at the kenosis hymn in philippians 2 5 through 11 you could look at the prologue to uh the letter to the hebrews i mean there uh Did or you the say entire Philippians? Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Yeah. yeah. Um, or the entire book of Revelation. <laughs> I mean, you know, there, there are, there is so much in that early Christian witness testifying to the divinity of Christ. In this, in this article I wrote, I was reflecting a little bit on when I was a grad student and seminary student back in the, in the nineties and early two thousands, just about like, 
kind of the scholarly climate in the religious academy at that time. It was when the Jesus seminar was really, you know, mm. revved up and 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 going good, you know, and their books were selling like hotcakes and and all kinds of stuff feel, like this. And yeah. you know, the the I, I think a lot of Christians were very persuaded by the writings of people like Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crossan about the I the the person and work of Jesus. In other words, who Jesus was and what he did. And I just this would just drive me bananas. Because I I I kept saying, you know, but are you thinking this through all the way to the bottom? Mm-hmm. Okay, what's lost if you go down this road? If Jesus was a wise teacher, let's just play this all the way through. What do you lose? Everything. Well, you lo- you lose everything. Yeah. Right. I mean, there's. Well, he, first of all. He wasn't a wise teacher. I mean, I realize that's the whole C.S. Lewis, liar, lunatic, or Lord. But, you know, what teachings are you talking about other than the ones that are in the Bible? You know, if you're just saying he's a good teacher, you must have like four or five things you think are good. But his teaching is also about himself. (laughs) But but you see, this is this one of the one of the moves, of course, that they were making at the time was this kind of uh, form critical approach to the Bible to say, well, well, you know, Jesus didn't actually say this. Right. He, he said these other things because they have they have the 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 ur text <laughs> of the person who was wandering around behind Jesus, you know, <laughs> with a dictaphone, <laughs> getting what he actually said. And dictaphone, Scott? That's a little <laughs> anachronistic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and somebody in the, like, first century Israel with a dictaphone? Is a that dictaphone is almost first century, though, <laughs> seriously. But that is, like, uh, right up your alley, though. That's probably it, it, <laughs> what you but, used to but, take notes. <laughs> But in um, it, it when I so like I was just a really p- bothersome seminary student. I was always the guy in my professor's office bugging them about stuff and driving Nothing. them crazy. And um, you know, one of now the you're in my office. No, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> No, and and at one point, you know, I read Crossan's book, Jesus Revolutionary Biography. Now, this is a shortened version of his big book on the historical Jesus, which is called Jesus, the Life of a Mediterranean Jewish Peasant. And, you know, Crossan is very, very knowledgeable and very compelling in the way he writes. And I read this thing and I'm like, what the what? <laughs> if this guy is right, if this book is even half right, everything I ever thought was true about God and about life and about Christ is wrong. And it looks like he's right. He mm-hmm. don't. He knew a lot more about history, you know, than a twenty-two-year-old. <laughs> He he knew he knew a lot more about history than a twenty two year old did first year <laughs> seminary student you know shocking but when I got into PhD work I I did go very carefully through his big uh, blue book on the historical Jesus uh, the historical Jesus life of Mediterranean Jewish peasant and I I really started to take apart his methodology now now. This is a long way of getting back to something that Scott talked about, the urtext. Okay, what is the urtext? If, the urtext is a, is a way of that, that historians sometimes talk about um, an original text that lies behind the current text, like Q or something like that. Okay? Although Q has a different meaning right now than what you're talking about. Right. Are you talking about QAnon? Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> they, people just call it Q now. So yeah, no, you might okay. need to specify what the you mean by Q. Hypothetical Q document, which is from the German word "quella," which means source. Which means source. Okay. So um, as I started getting into to Crossan's method, he lists his sources, 
And about half of his sources, not half, but a lot of them, were hypothetical documents. In other words, they're documents we didn't have that have been reconstructed as urtexts. And I thought, this is what gave me so much heartburn as a 20-something seminary student who was about to give up on Christianity? Now, wait a second. You have to clarify why you don't need to be worried about urtexts. Like for the regular lay person who might be thinking, oh, well, so there are things that you can put together. But this is compared to what? Well, I mean, these were texts or parts of texts that we just don't have. Right. They're, they're completely hypothesized. And I'm sorry, when you don't have data that backs up your point, you, you, you don't, don't really it. strengthen your argument by making up hypothetical data. Okay. Right. Now, the, the easiest thing, I mean, you can argue anything if you were going to do that, right? And people do. We the, have a, when I was in college, this is an aside, but it's, a, it's pertinent, really. So my, my roommate was, his name's Ken, and, and uh, you know, he, we would have, like, you know, knock down undergraduate kind of theoretical fights about, you know, who knows what, you know, economics, politics, whatever. And he would just, if he got too frustrated, he would just start making up facts to win the argument. And we now have, there's actually a word for this now. It's called a Ken fact. It's just a fact you make up to win an argument. It's a Ken fact. Yeah. I've been in those kinds of arguments, but, but okay. The hypothetical documents, the best example of this is the hypothetical Q document. And that's the one that there's the best evidence for, right? The hypothetical Q document is a, say supposedly a say a document of sayings that right. Matthew and Luke used in writing their gospels that explains why they have such close agreement in certain places <laughs> or you you could also you know hypothesize i think it's just a much more elegant the the what's called the farrer hypothesis it's a much more elegant hypothesis just to say that luke was reading matthew well, I mean, there is, I mean, so here's, here's my thing about, about Q is Eusebius in his history quotes Papias, right. who's an earlier church historian who says, Matthew wrote down the sayings. And Papias everyone, who knew John. Right. And everybody translate in, in Aramaic, mm-hmm. the sayings of Jesus in Aramaic and everyone translated them as best as they could, which means that what he's talking about Matthew is not what we have as the gospel of Matthew. It's, it's a say, a list of sayings. And we imagine in the ancient world that there were, you know, there's of course the Aramaic tradition that's probably preserved by the Jerusalem church as it's going to Antioch or wherever. And there's also some Greek translations floating around. And it's quite plausible that the community that produced the gospel of Matthew had the actual original Aramaic text and Luke, who presumably doesn't speak Aramaic, was using a Greek translation. You know, it's, it's not a. And so then there is kind of a Q text. I mean, it, but yeah, Q, I mean, there but, there were earlier texts. There were yeah, earlier yeah. texts that we don't have. We we know that. But the more you rely upon texts, I mean, you can get away with it with like one, like Q. But you know, well. I have the Gospel of Thomas, but, <laughs> but, but the Gospel of Thomas is a little bit late for it to say what I want to say. But guess what? There was an early recension of the Gospel of Thomas right. that I can identify, which I can date right to the period of time I need it to be in in order to make the point I want to make. That is amazingly coincidental. It's so Fantastic. helpful. Yes. I think, I think that the point – that is important to make, especially for non, uh, for people who don't research as a profession, um, like academics, like, like you academics who live in your perfect ivory towers with no messes. It's so perfect. Yeah. So so ivory. Have you (laughs) been to my office? (laughs) (laughs) Is that, is that having a source text is not the problem. It's, it's, it's a the hypothetical texts 
<laughs> imaginary things, those are problematic. But that also that it's there's a critical mass uh, that happens when everybody is saying the same thing that actually means something after a while. You know, if if there was only one person saying that Jesus was God, well, then that would be easy to dismiss. But it's not just one person. It's lots and lots and lots of people. So it's the earliest uh, Christian, the earliest Christian confession is Jesus right. is Lord. Right. right. And they knew what that meant in the yes. early church. It didn't mean G- it didn't mean Jesus is governor or something. Right. Our problem, our well, problem today, it does, frankly, as long is as that, the universe, you know. Right. Our problem today is that we don't know what it means. Right. We don't know what it means to say Jesus is Lord. We say, oh, Jesus is my Lord, my personal Lord that I crafted in my own image, however I want him to be. But no. Jesus is your own God. personal Jesus. Yeah, thank you. Someone who will hear your <laughs> prayers. Someone who's there. Yes. Now we know how ancient David is. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, it's it's going through my head too right now. <laughs> Mine too. Yeah. I'm still. But you're too young. Too. You're too young for that. I had an older sibling. Mm. I have multiple older. Anyway. So, yeah. Anyway, they're glad we settled this. <laughs> Did we? I mean, here's the question. Are most evangelicals actually heretics? Or at least a third of them? I can't really, I still can't figure out how 65% at one thing believe Jesus is a creature and 35% don't believe he's God or whatever. It doesn't make any sense to me. But nonetheless, I mean, if it is true that the people who claim to be the most orthodox and conservative of Christians in the United States are actually heretics. That could be, that could, that might not bode well for the, uh, you know. The future of the church. The, yeah, the, the propagation of the gospel. If those who commit themselves, who call themselves gospel Christians don't know what it is. I think it's kind of a both and honestly, I mean, I think that I'm no, in all seriousness, I think that you're probably right that they are probably not thinking about all of the implications of the language of the question. The question is maybe slightly tricky, but the other thing is, is that, you know, we have a hard time to be maintaining our distinctiveness. You know, you can say conservative evangelical, and even in my own mind, I hear the word conservative, I think politics. Yeah. So plenty of people, whether it's explicitly approved of or tacitly approved of, are thinking, I can be a politically conservative evangelical, and that is a religious thing unto itself. But it's not. It is not. Well, and that phrase evangelical can mean, you know, so many things like, you know, I believe Jesus loves me. And at some point in my life, I felt some warm, fuzzy feeling in my heart. Or, you know, I went forward when I was seven years old and signed a piece of paper right. that said I was a believer. Right. You know, I chose to believe or, sure. or whatever. You know, I mean, what what people mean when they check the box evangelical. Yeah, it's varied. <laughs> it's varied. And like I said, it's not like I am a member of a Roman Catholic church, right? I commune in the Roman Catholic or I have a membership in a quote mainline denomination that consists of these seven churches. Anyway. And and by my emphaticness, I'm not trying to say that conservatism is not okay. I'm just saying that political anything is not actually a part of a religious identity in Christ. Your identity in Christ is something unique and it has to be protected and maintained and nurtured and you cannot adulterate it with other things it's actually that is your job your responsibility as a christian is to work as hard as you can to preserve it and that means saying even if it if you risk other people thinking you're something that you're not resist the urge to attach other modifiers just let it be what it is for crying out loud we need words to mean what they're supposed to mean. And we need to stop trying to explain it all the time and just let 
your lived life, your witness in Christ can be part of how that helps people understand what it means to be Christian. All right. I'm sorry. (laughs) So how do you feel Maggie? Oh my gosh. (laughs) The political season is my least favorite liturgical season. (laughs) That's a joke. Can we go back to talking about hypothetical documents? <laughs> okay. That, that was super interesting for me. <laughs> you guys, I think this has been our podcast for better or for worse. <laughs> it is what it is. Um, if you're interested, newsweek.com published this. It's when? a t- don't read that. Just read the go to <laughs> go to the tell them where the 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 website is for the for the actual results that are coming sure. out. Sure. You can go to the state of theology.com to find the actual results of the uh, survey. And it, it is definitely interesting reading. The questions are interesting, the uh, the breakdowns of who thinks what. And um, another thing I think was kind of interesting is the the numbers, the volume of each group asked. It's interesting. You can separate all that stuff out. These are things to think about. And uh, all you academics in your ivory towers, you know, you can go to that that website, the State of Theology, and fix the problems. Because obviously that's your job. (laughs) (laughs) So thank you. And uh, give us a follow on Twitter, at Holy Spirit Pod. Follow us on Facebook rate and like the podcast so people can find us and if you haven't already go check out firebrand magazine at firebrandmag.com or at firebrand mag on twitter and if you are a writer check out our submission standards we would love to receive an abstract from you for review i think that's it for today anything else no united theological seminary we miss your studio yes we do I really want COVID to be over. Me too. Me too. All right, guys. We'll come back to you next time. Yep. Bye. Bye. Bye.